Good morning. <laughs> it's nice to see everybody here this morning. Why don't we go ahead and we're going to get started with our praise and worship this morning. Let's sing our hearts out to God with this is amazing grace. way to get the praise started in the morning, but I just figured it was funny enough and actually kind of true enough that I'd share that. We're going to continue with Forever Rain. <laughs> Thank you. 
I started to become a little, you know, let me spritz. I started to become a little, like, almost emotional when it just said, like, it's the, not even the part that I would look at the song and say, like, oh, that's really cool. That's one of the most, like, the biggest things. But it was just, you are here. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, he is here. We're gathered here, and we're all praising him together. And just running into his arm when he's right here is just awesome, and he's always with us. It's funny, yesterday, I was taking, it was like a nice little hike near my house. It's in Scotland, it's the Rock Spring Preserve. Like, you go, and you go downhill. You go by the river. You go up a hill. There's a cliff. It's really pretty. And part of it was there's actually an old spring. And I think, I'm trying to remember what it says, like, Old Barn Indian Spring or Indian Well or something like that. And it's like literally you go off the road, you go like a mile something down a hill into the woods, and there's this well in the middle of nowhere, like a really old well. And it's cool, like the water, it's, it's so full. Like obviously now it's like flowing everywhere, but even when it's not raining, it's like there's always water there. And it kind of pours, the well's just beautiful. I wish I could show you a picture. Then like the water comes out, and then down here there's like another. I mean, it's a big a stream, pool, whatever. But coming out of the ground, it's like you can see these springs like bubbling up out of the ground and like the sand going, and it's, it's so cool. And of course, me being a little kid, I take my hiking pole, I poke it in the little things that are coming up and play with it and swirl it around. And like I said, I'm a little kid. But it'll get like a little mucky, but then it cleans up like right away after that to just beautiful, amazing, clean water just coming out of the ground. So last night I was thinking, I was brought to a verse in John 7. Let's start at 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. And up until that, spirit, that, up until that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. But Jesus has been glorified at this time, and we do have his spirit with us. And I just, I don't know, it's kind of cool to think of that little spring coming out of the ground with all that water coming out of it. Even when it's not wet like this and it's nice and dry, there's still that water coming out of it. I might go and poke it and mess it up every now and then and <laughs> make it a little messy and it cleans up again. I don't know, to me that was just like an amazing picture of just that water that's always coming to us. So just think about that constant water in your life and he's always here. Let's go ahead and pray as we think of him being here with us always. Dear Father God, this is the time, God, that we lift our hearts to you, God. This is the time that our hearts praise you, God. And I just thank you that you give us this time that we can praise and worship you as part of our church, God. I just pray that you just help us to be more aware of that living water that is in all of us, that Holy Spirit that we have with us all the time, God. Even if we kind of stir it up and muck it up a bit and kind of say, yeah, not right now, you're still there with us and you clear it up pretty quickly, God. I just pray that this morning you just help us to lift our voices and lift our hearts so that you can feel our love for you pouring out this morning. Thank you so much. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
above all.
There's, o- there's, only, like, there's only two options. There's, there's, the, there's literally a combination of four, right? On, off, mute, and unmuted. So it can be on and muted, or off and muted, or on and muted, or um, on and muted. It shouldn't take that long. I know, so I like tried one twice, clearly. All right, well, good to see you all. <laughs> You'll never get that 45 seconds back from your life. Um, we are going to be having communion today. A couple of things as we share communion. One of the things that's going to be different as we do communion this Sunday um, is that we won't be uh, passing the tray out uh, just in light of uh, the current cautions about um, touching things. We will have each person come forward. And so when communion comes forward, we'll have you come forward um, to grab one of the, the uh, pieces out of the tray, one of the sets out of the tray. For those of you who are gluten-free, we do have a gluten-free option for a cookie, not a cookie, for the bread. That's off to the right, off to your left as you come up. It's under the tray. Now, here's what I am suggesting. Rather than, because sometimes people get choosy, right? Everything's the same. It's like the kid who all of them are the same, but they want to touch every one. And some of you are like that. So I'm going to have elders who will hand them to you as you come. So elders, if you would please uh, come forward at the time. Uh, make sure you uh, clean your hands here, and then we'll come out and hand them to you as we distribute communion. So when we do communion, that's how we'll do it. Does that make sense? You with me? Y'all are going to have to come forward. Now, if you have trouble coming forward, if, if you would rather have it brought to you, um, I, we will have one, two, three, four. If we have four elders in the house, one of them can be a runner and grab it and send it to you. Make sense so far? It's an experiment, and if it fails miserably, we'll try something else next time. Um, all right, let's have a few announcements. The first one is that I just want to give a great big uh, thank you and round of applause to everybody who participated in this year's Vacation Bible School. Can you please give those folks a round of applause? <laughs> it is always a massive undertaking. Every year it's a massive undertaking. This year, because we had it outdoors, there were additional logistics to be taken care of. Um, so just, just a few highlights from the week. Number one, I think I received more mosquito bites than I ever have in my entire life. Right? I think I have mosquito bites on mosquito bites. I'm not even joking. That's how many mosquito bites there were. Um, but we had a tent. Thank you to the Lions Club for uh, selling us the, the opportunity to, to rent a tent. Um, we had that. That was a very a good addition. Um, and I want to uh, thank Sandy uh, Thrall, particularly for her work in doing the Bible study. She did a fabulous job. I just want to say thank you. Um, uh, Chris Warner uh, was just instrumental in moving things up and down. It was just, there was so much toting back and forth. I can't tell you how many times we moved things up the hill and down the hill. So give him a, bit, a special thanks because he was particularly <laughs> helpful for that. Um, all, of the, all of the youth volunteers who came, it was really great, and I can't remember all of them. Some of them aren't here. Abby um, particularly did a great job helping to do the hand motions, um, and so Abby Landry. And so if you, if you have a chance to thank her, would you please do so? She did a great job. Uh, but, of course, we could not do any of this uh, without both Gavin and Sandy Caldwell. Sandy, who coordinated, and Gavin, who spent most of his vacation here um, this week of vacation doing various things, carrying things up and down, making things, everything worked, and then um, also um, being uh, the ranger bear. Ranger bear apparently is there. That's ranger bear. <laughs> yeah. So you know that you love Jesus when you're willing to wear something that ridiculous <laughs> in order to help people to get to know him. That, is, that takes dedication. And last but certainly not least, uh, Wendell, who helped set everything up uh, for sound, toning it back and forth and getting it set up. It was instrumental. Um, so can, I, I know that Sandy doesn't like it when I call her up, so I won't, but Sandy, could you please stand and just give us an opportunity to say thank you. We appreciate all of your work. And, um, uh, a few other announcements as we continue. Um, uh, for, I don't remember, how much did we raise? Oh, $285 was raised uh, that, for the, the mission project. Um, we had 31 kids on an average basis, uh, give or take, each day. $285 was raised. We're sending that to David Holland to help to support him for Cornerstone uh, Baptist Church in Norwich. 
Um, going forward here as we have things to look to this coming month, um, elders meeting will take place on August 3rd, and that will also be an elders and deacons meeting. And so um, one of the things we'll be tackling is how to get some of the deacon responsibilities done given the fact that we have so few deacons. Um, and so that'll be an important meeting. So I encourage you to come. Uh, August 14th, Hope Fest at the Brooklyn Fairgrounds, 4 to 9 p.m. Uh, Polly Ann is meeting at 10 a.m. in the conference room on August 19th, and then we'll be starting Grief Share on August 26th um, at 6.30 p.m. For, at Grace Cafe. And uh, just to give you an idea as to what Grief Share is about, Grief Share is not only uh, grieving the loss of a loved one, although that's certainly what it's for, and it's certainly appropriate for that. But we've been through really kind of a crazy 15, 16, 17 months. Um, and I have known people who <clears throat> had losses in their life that they really never got to mourn or to deal with because it just went from loss to loss to loss to COVID, right? And, and the world has just sort of been kind of running on adrenaline since then. And so no, this is an opportunity, Lord willing, for us to sit down, to take a breath, and to work through some of the things that we work through, that we should work through, that we never had really an opportunity to work through. All right, um, let's uh, go before the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing upon our time this morning. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for every opportunity that you give us to come together as your people, to enjoy the blessings of fellowship, to raise our voices to you in worship, for you are worthy of it. And to hear your word opened, spoken, and Lord, that our hearts might be touched by those words that we may grow in our sanctification and obedience to you. Lord God, we know that apart from you, we can do nothing. And so this Sunday morning, as we celebrate the Lord's table, Lord God, we pray that you would use that as an opportunity to remind us of our constant need of your grace. And this morning we fall upon your grace in prayer in a couple of ways. First, God, we ask that you will continue to show grace to those who are in need and within our fellowship. Father, I think of my brother Neil Christopher. Would you continue to be with him? I think of Bruce Trombley. Lord God, will you be with him as he seeks decisions about dealing with spinal fusion? Lord God, I pray that you'll be with uh, Laura Lambert as she uh, looks at the possibility of surgery here. Uh, Lord God, please, please be with them and help them to make the decisions that they need to make to endure the circumstances that they have. And Lord God, I pray that you will be close to them. But God, you also know that not all of our infirmities and wounds are physical. And so, Father, I pray for those who may be struggling during this time, struggling with fear, perhaps, struggling with loneliness or isolation. Lord God, <clears throat> just struggling with a sense of disorientation in the midst of a, a pandemic that just doesn't want to end. Father, I pray that you will be with them, that you will be the lifter of their head, uh, that you will salve their heart and their conscience and their mind and give them a sense of your peace. And Father, I pray for the spiritual needs of each of us. I pray for those who don't know you. I pray for those, Lord, who came to VBS this year, those children who, who received you and those who may have heard the gospel but have not yet received you. And I pray, Lord, that that word would sit in their heart and would, would grow, germinate and grow, Lord, into a, a wonderful opportunity for them to enjoy faith. And I pray for their parents that uh, their coming may give us the opportunity to reach out to them and to minister to them as well. Uh, but, Lord, ultimately we pray that the name of your son Jesus would be made much of in this place. Lord God, as we gather here together, we gather for fellowship, we gather for prayer, we gather for preaching, but ultimately we gather uh, that you may be honored, the name of your Son may be lifted high, the gospel of your Son may be faithfully proclaimed, and Lord God, that we may celebrate the grace that you have given us. 
So I pray that you'll prepare our hearts to celebrate at your table, to share communion this morning, that you will remind us of your grace, that you will show us the things in our life where we need to turn and repent, that you will assure us that if we confess those sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I pray, Lord God, that by the time we are done, you will send us out of this room, Lord God, having experienced your presence, having experienced that renewal, knowing within our heart of hearts that we are loved, we are cared for, we are accepted in your Son, and we have been sent with an important mission. And I pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Well, one of the things that communion is about It's about our identity, and as we continue on in our sermon series on what it means to be in Christ, to have our identity in Christ, communion provides us with an opportunity to see a big contrast that occurred in the way that God deals with humanity. One of the things that is paradoxical about Christianity is that we celebrate a God who is never changing, right? God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The character and nature of God does not change. He is God forevermore, existing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, fully loving, fully good, fully righteous in all he does and all he says and all his ways. The vision that Isaiah the prophet gives in Isaiah chapter 6 of a God who is thrice holy has never changed. But the paradox of Christianity as we look through the scriptures is that God does in fact change the way that he interacts and deals with individuals. The way that he interacted with Moses is different than the way that he interacts with us today. And while he is the same God, he reveals himself progressively through the scriptures so that by the time you get to the new covenant, you have a clearer picture of God than perhaps Abraham did even though Abraham heard directly his voice. I've often asked the question in environments like Sunday school, what it would be like if you were Moses or Abraham or Joshua, hearing from God in a very direct way. And, And the misunderstanding, and I think the misconception, is that they experienced God more directly than we do. But the reality of the matter is that there's no evidence in the Old Testament that suggests that Abraham or Moses or anyone else has as clear a picture of who God is as we do. Because God has revealed himself to us in a way that he has not revealed himself to those, even some prophets in the Old Testament as father, son, son, and spirit. And as we believe in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit has come to live within us because of our confession of faith. That is a unique experience that I believe most in the Old Testament had no blessing of. And so as we look to the Lord's table, we look to a change, a change in the way that God deals with people, and change can be a challenging thing. Having a memorial meal like this, and in essence, a representation of that change is something that the churches did not always deal with well. And so if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we'll look at an instance in the New Testament in which the church was struggling to make sense of and to practice appropriately the Lord's Supper. What's interesting is that this particular verse tells us about the Lord's Supper, perhaps in the greatest details outside of the Gospels, but it also is addressing some of the struggles that the Corinthians were having with the Lord's Supper and practicing it appropriately. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the 17th verse, we read this. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. 
When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the word of the Lord in our hearing it this morning. Paul does something pretty interesting as he addresses some of the divisions that they had and some of the problems with celebrating the Lord's Supper, which was very much a potluck if you want substantiation for potlucks in the Bible. All you have to do is go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm convinced that every Lord's Supper in as far as it was practiced in the New Testament time, was essentially a potluck. Everybody brought their own stuff. And, and what was happening is that some people were coming early and eating and leaving nothing left for anyone else. So he's like, it's not the Lord's Supper that you're celebrating. You're, the gluttons are coming early, right? It's like an all-you-can-eat kind of thing. And so you've got to get there early because if there's, it's all-you-can-eat, there's not enough for everybody necessarily. And the second thing he says, there are divisions in the church. There's divisions. There are some people who say they subscribe to this person or they belong to, to this faction of the church or they're this kind of person or that kind of person. Does this sound at all familiar to the way that we're struggling with things in the modern church now? I mean, there are just so many factions in our church, not our church necessarily, but in our collective church in America um, that it is very grievous. It really is. I mean, you have the political factions within the churches uh, and within the church. You have the, you know, the goodness gracious, the issue between masks and no masks and vaccines and no vaccines. There, there's so many different factions and ways that the church has chosen to splinter itself off that it is very grievous. And how Paul addressed that is very interesting. He pointed, it's not trying to sort it all out. Instead of taking every issue and trying to sort out every issue and enumerating the problems with each position and refuting that which is wrong and affirming that which is right, Paul does something interesting. He points first to the reality that underlies the celebration of the Lord's Supper. I'm going to say that again and see if I can make it clear. Instead of addressing those issues... Paul points to Jesus. He says, this is what the Lord's Supper is about. Here's who Jesus is. Here is why that is important. And while he does so in a way that reminds us of the Lord's Supper, there's, there's a, an infinite amount of meaning that can come from the celebration we're about to engage in. If I can, if I can get you to turn to Hebrews chapter 10 we will look at some of the amazing changes that occurred in the new covenant that the Lord's Supper helps us to recognize. And while Paul doesn't necessarily go into detail in the book of 1 Corinthians about these changes, I believe the Lord's Supper iconifies and reminds us of these changes that took place in the way that God dealt with humanity. And that by reminding us of them, even today, we can walk out having a deeper understanding of who we are in Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to start in the 11th verse, where the word says this. And, and as I read, I'm, I'm really looking into the context of the differences between what happened between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Referring to the Old Covenant, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 11 says this, Every priest 
stands daily at his services, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made his footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. One of the challenges we have is we have the benefit of seeing the fullness of the Bible as we get to see the fullness of Revelation is placing ourselves in the position of someone who had to live through the transitions that Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and Paul, I believe, spoke of in Hebrews chapter 10. What must have it been like to have grown up in a Jewish home and to have been accustomed to daily hear and to see and to recognize the sacrifices that would have taken place that we were told were there as atonement for our sin. To be told that because of what Jesus has done, that system has been brought to an end, that plan that God had and the way that he dealt with humanity would be come to an end and a new plan would come into place, a new covenant, a better covenant that was secured by a better sacrifice. And the reason it's better is at least threefold. The first one is this. According to Hebrews chapter 10, just the 11th verse clearly tells us that the Old Testament sacrifices were perpetual. They were perpetual. They had to be done day after day. The second, as we'll read in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, is that they were a reminder of sin for the people rather than a propitiation for them. For since the law is but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. And I want you to just take a minute and hear that again. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities... It can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would, not have been, they would not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Now, Paul is speaking there of the celebration of Yom Kippur, where once a year people would be come together and there would be a ceremony where the sins of the people would be laid upon two goats. One would be slaughtered in, in the Holy of Holies as a sacrifice to the Lord, and the second one would be the scapegoat, where the chief priest would put his hand on the scapegoat and would send him out of the camp as a representation of the separation of the sin to the people. Now, I don't know which coat got it worse, Right? There's one that's certain death. The other one is sent out by himself. I don't know if you know this, but goats don't fare well by themselves, right? So it's like you die now or you die later. But the Bible is clear that both of those goats did not remove the sin from the people. In fact, they were an annual reminder of sin. They were a shadow. I don't know, one of the things that I used to do to torture my brother, um, we, were, we were bored, and we didn't have as many electronics as they have today. So we used to have shadow fights. Anybody else have shadow fights with your brother or your sister? We'd wait, we'd go outside, we'd pretend to box each other in the shadow, right? Per periodically, I would get too close. <laughs> and so would he. We both survived it. 
But what, that's really not the torture. That's just what brothers do, right? Accidentally, on purpose, hitting each other. That's just normal, everyday kind of occurrences for brothers and sisters. What I used to do for shadowing is I, I, I learned just by observation that there is a time of day in which you essentially don't have a shadow, right? So we would say, hey, are we going to shadow box tomorrow, Brian? I said, yeah, of course we're going we're to shadow box tomorrow. Morning. We'll do it at noon. By the way, I'm stealing your shadow. No, you're not. So he walked out at noon. Guess what? He didn't have a shadow. He ran in crying to my mother, telling her that I stole his shadow. I can't remember how much time I spent in my room for that, but <laughs> the point is clear. It's not just a dumb story. There is never a point, and I want you, I want you to realize this. There's never a point in which your shadow is a perfect representation of you. Do you realize that? There's never a time in which your shadow is a perfect representation of you. Sometimes it's super long. Sometimes it's super short. Sometimes it's skewed to the right. Sometimes it leans to the left, right? Sometimes your arms are super long. Sometimes they're super short on your shadow. But there is never a time in which your shadow is a perfect representation of you. As far as I know, never a time in which it absolutely 100% looks like you. Never. That's the nature of the way the sun making your shadow distorts your image. And while the law required that sacrifices be done, the Bible says that they were always but a shadow of the better things that were to come. They always represented the removal of sin, but they could not themselves remove sin, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Now Paul in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 4 were only, was only talking about Yom Kippur. But the verse we just read talked about the daily sacrifices that Numbers 28 verses 1 through 3 tell us about. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the people of Israel and say to them, My offering, my food, for my food offerings, my pleasant aroma, you shall be careful to offer to me at its appointed time. And you shall say to them, this is the food offering that you shall offer to the Lord, two male lambs, a year old, without blemish, day by day, as a regular offering. And so the priests would engage in their work, their shadowy work of offering a sacrifice to the Lord daily. But verse 12 reminds us of this great change that God instituted when he sent his son Jesus. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sacrificed, who are being sanctified. The great change that is, would have been astounding to the people who were living in the old covenant time is that by one sacrifice, not daily sacrifices, by one single self-sacrifice of Jesus' blood on the cross, he has completed or perfected us for all time, those of us who are in the process of being made holy or being sanctified. Here's what that means from a practical standpoint. This is not a reminder of your sinfulness. It's not. Now, I know that that's the way it's been treated in some churches. It is not a reminder of our sinfulness. It is an assurance of our forgiveness. Do you understand the difference? A reminder of our sinfulness comes to this and says... Oh, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people who are unclean. And all of that is true. But the emphasis is not on the sin that caused the blood of Christ. The emphasis is on the assurance of forgiveness that the blood of Christ grants us. The appropriate response to the Lord's Supper is joy. You know, sometimes I, sometimes I think that we, we kind of miss that when we do the Lord's Supper and everything's so somber, right? 
maybe we should be cheering the whole time. Because yes, the only thing that we bring to the Lord's table is our sinfulness, but that which we bring away from the Lord's table is so astounding in the way that God changed the way that he deals with humanity that I can't think of any other appropriate response than to say hallelujah for what God has done. You are fully and finally forgiven of all things by one sacrifice and by the blood of Jesus. I, I don't... I don't think we sort of get that, but, but in the Old Testament, they would have gone, that's, that's crazy. First of all, if you're a priest, now you got to update your resume. Because what you've been doing every day, you no longer have to do. By one sacrifice, he has perfected for all time. That's it. One sacrifice. That's it. That's why we don't do sacrifices. I've told the story before. It's kind of funny. You probably remember it. My brother-in-law came to visit us once when Nikki and I were in Colorado. And he wasn't a believer and we were young believers and I was still a little more, well, I was more honorary than I am now. I still am probably honorary, but I was more honorary then. So he says, I know you, you know, you're Christians now. Nikki's a Christian now. You guys do whatever ritual you do before you eat. And I said, well, normally... We sacrifice a chicken. <laughs> I said, but today we'll probably just pray and eat. Is that cool with you? <laughs> the, the whole idea of this, it sounded so funny. It's like, we'll do some ritual, right? It's like, we just pray. Why don't we do daily sacrifices? Why is it not my responsibility to cut something up? You know, I, I, sort, of, I sort of had a flyby of that this, this week. It was like, it must have been Friday, Sandy calls me and she goes, there's a dead deer sitting on the top of the hill at the church we're having VBS tomorrow, right? you got to be joking me. So I'm like, what do I do? So I, I tie the deer by its hind legs and I start dragging it. And I'm like, this must be something that Old Testament people had to do. And I'm so glad we are not there because I never want, I remember why I don't hunt anymore, right? It's not the shooting that's, not, that's the hard part. It's the dragging that's the hard part. I won't spare you the rest of the details, but we dragged it shallowly into the woods, and a few days later, Gavin had to bury it. So he also had to do some priestly work this year. There, there is a reason nobody brings me stuff to kill, right? It's not my job. It's an Old Testament job. It's not a new job. By one sacrifice, he has perfected for all time those who are being made holy. Hebrews 10, verses 5 through 7 say it this way, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And I hope that we'll take away from that reality two things. One is the magnitude of the cost. The magnitude of the cost. My grandfather used to say something silly when we were talking, eating breakfast. He said, when it comes to your bacon and eggs, he said, the chicken made a contribution, but the pig made a sacrifice. Right. If all we're doing is giving a contribution, we don't really understand the nature of sacrifice. The nature of sacrifice for Jesus was the loss of his life. It was the willing self-giving, the laying down of his life. And from the immensity of that sacrifice comes the immensity of our forgiveness. And the Lord's Supper celebrates that complete forgiveness. It gives us an assurance that that I hope that we can walk around in. 1 John 
Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 say this. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I happen to think that people tend to misuse that understanding of that verse some. Because <clears throat> I, I don't think it's a, I sinned, now I have to confess and get forgiven afresh. Oh, I sinned again, now I have to confess and get forgiven afresh. And oh, I sinned here, and now I have to confess and get forgiven afresh. You do that, you just walk around constantly confessing sin. Rather, I think it is if we acknowledge the reality of our sinfulness before God, then we can be assured that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is not so much a prescription of a, of a liturgy as much as it is an assurance of the greatness of the sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf and the assurance of the forgiveness that we have from it. So that you can walk out of here being reminded you're forgiven. It becomes not a reminder of our sinfulness. It becomes a reminder of our forgiveness. And then that bleeds over into the way that we treat other people. It becomes a pattern for us to follow. In Colossians 3.13, the Bible says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So... You must also forgive. If there's one thing I hope that we can, we can learn from this is that we walk in forgiveness as Christians, both as forgiven people and as forgiving people. Does that make sense? It ought to flow right out of our identity as who we are in Jesus. It should. There's a, there's a huge disconnect if you don't recognize your forgiveness, that God has forgiven you because of his son. There's also a huge disconnect if you don't walk in forgiveness in the sense that you are not forgiving of others. And then lastly, as we begin to prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper testifies to the ongoing work of our sanctification. There's this reality that God has given to us by virtue of the death of his son, the full forgiveness of our sins. In essence, the completeness of our being in the sight of God because of what Jesus has done for us. So that when God looks at us, he doesn't see us as these broken people walking around. He sees us as those adopted in his son, as his children, as fully and finally forgiven, as the holiness of Christ has been placed upon us. But we're also have to live <clears throat> the reality of humility which says we're not there yet. That we are not the people that we know that Christ has destined us to be. I mean, can we all just agree to that, right? Nobody has yet arrived as a Christian. Right? It always used to bother, well, it, it never used to bother me, it does now. Like every time you see some of these pictures, medieval pictures of, of, of New Testament characters, apart from Jesus, who deserved to have a halo, like you see all these saints and they have halos, right? What a crock, right? Just read through your Bible. They were messed up. They had fights and disagreements. There are times that they, there are times that you wonder if Peter is just ever going to get it, Right? Like, there are some serious, duh moments in the New Testament from people that have been painted with halos. They're, apart from Jesus, ain't none of us got halos. Okay? We are positionally in Christ perfected, but walking around on this world, none of us have arrived. So we can all just, we can all just breathe deeply and recognize we're not perfect and God's still working on us. Okay, can you just say that? God's still working on me. Look, if that doesn't tell you that God's still working on you, but he's not done with you yet, and he's not finished, but he's faithful, I don't know what tells you that. 
So we walk out in this imperfection that we live in in the same way that we came to know him. Colossians 2, verses 6 through 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, by grace through faith, apart from works, right? So walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. That means that we grow by grace. Here's the problem that I see that many Christians get. They're like, well, I get saved by grace, and then I get sanctified by works. That's how it works in a lot of churches. Get saved, get busy. About three quarters of the way down the line, they're like, this ain't working. I feel just as spiritually exhausted as the last day I remember being lost. That's because nobody's cutting you any slack and you look at yourself as less than spiritually in the mirror. And you forgot this whole project is a project based on grace. The whole thing, beginning to end. You were saved by grace. Therefore, continue to receive grace. Man, cut yourself some slack, you're a sinner. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 says this, Beloved, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and work for his good pleasure. The work outworking of our salvation is, is predicated upon the inworking of God's spirit in our life. And the way that works out for us is that we need to continually run to God. Sunday school, we were talking a little bit about Jonah and how Jonah wound up in Nineveh one way or the other. You realize that? I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. God says, go to Nineveh. Jonah says, no thanks. So he gets on a boat headed to Tarshish. And what does God do? He sends a storm. They have to toss him overboard. He gets eaten up by a big fish, right? It may have been a whale. Likely it wasn't. It was probably just a huge fish. For three days, he's in this fish, which is not some roomy place. It's not like a cabin on the Queen Mary, right? He's in the stomach of a fish floating around with whatever else is in there. And eventually he gets tired. He's like, God, could you please deliver me? So the fish pukes him up. Guess where? To shores of Nineveh. Moral of the story. You're going where God's taking you one way or the other. (laughs) We can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. Right? But brothers and sisters, he bought you with the price. The blood of Christ saved you. You're getting to heaven either the easy way Or the hard way. You with me? Here's the easy way. Verse 19, Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest, great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. There's two dimensions to that. Oddly enough, there's two elements to communion. The first one recognizes the body. And as a body, we're to encourage one another. So here's my challenge. We're going to take communion together. You're going to come forward. You're going to get one of these things. It tastes. If you're getting one of these, I apologize in advance. It tastes like styrofoam. I think it might be bread, but I can't be sure. Okay? 
It represents the body of Christ. It represents the unity that we have in the body of Christ. So rather than just taking of this and letting it be empty, when, before we leave here today, would you say something encouraging to somebody else? Encourage each other all the more. Just see the day drawing near. It also has juice, I think. Right? Which represents the blood of Christ. The blood of the new covenant which cleanses us from all sin. Before you leave here today, will you run to God? Unpack all that junk that you're toting around and just leave it at the cross. So you got, here's where I've messed up, here's where I've messed up, here's where I'm struggling, here's where I'm terrified, here's where I'm sad, Here's all this junk in my life and just leave it out there. Just leave it there. Just cut yourself some slack. Recognize you're still in process and leave it at the cross. Will you do that? As the elders come forward, can we pray together? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. God, I pray that the bread that we partake in will be a reminder of our togetherness. That if we've come to that place in our life and we've accepted Jesus, then we are one. One with you and one with another. And may the encouragement that we receive from you in this meal be a reason for us to show encouragement to others. And Father, as we partake of the, the cup with that reminder of the shed blood of our Lord and Savior on the cross. Bring afresh to our remembrance that we are forgiven and set free. And that by grace you can sort out all the messy parts of our life. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, so, logistically, if uh, you are on the inside, if you want to come on up and grab one of these, I will hand it to you. Can I get another elder who would be willing to hand out over there? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, if you have one gluten-free, um, these are gluten-free crackers right here. Um, so we got Dennis, would you mind handing out, just we're going to hand them out to people as they come forward. Um, oh, and then, okay. yeah, and then okay. I'll hand you one. All right, now we're gonna we're gonna let people come forward to grab it. Okay. I want Do it a little different. You want one of these? I want it. No, no, no. Okay. All right, there you go. Ready? Yeah. Okay, Gavin, do you want to bring some to people who need them? Okay. Do you want to? Okay. So raise your hand if you if you need it brought to you. Got two. All right, brother.
If you are visiting here at Baptist Fellowship, I want to let you know that we have an open communion policy, which means that if you have a relationship with Christ, if you've come to that place in your life in which you've placed your trust in him, you're welcome to celebrate with us. Communion is part of our church family because you're part of the family of God. I'm going to have my brother, uh, Paul, if he wishes to, uh, bring a prayer over the bread before we partake. Heavenly Father, I'd like to thank you at this time for always taking care and providing for us as you did so many years ago. We thank you for that as we bless you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now as we take the cup, if you can get the foil off, that's your right kid. Take the child protection sleeve off the top. And as we think of the cup, we take a minute, just unpack all those parts of your life you want to leave at the cross. I think the worship team has a song as we just kind of spend some time in the quietness of our hearts.
Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this reminder. Not so much a reminder of our sins that are many, or the struggles that we continue to have and the problems in our life that continue to plague us. But the reminder that on the cross Jesus dealt fully and finally with each one of them so that he can look upon us and say, my son and my daughter, you are forgiven. You are my child and you are loved. And we thank you for that precious truth in Jesus' name and all God's people said. And now it's our great tradition here at Baptist Fellowship to stand together and to sing that great hymn, Amazing Grace. May the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love that God has shown to you through the death of his son, may the blood of Christ which cleanses you from all sin remind you that you are forgiven and loved and set free. And may the body of Christ be a reminder to you that we encourage one another as a family all the more as we anticipate that precious day in which Jesus will return to this earth claiming his own, establishing his glorious kingdom for all to see. Until then, Lord God, may we rejoice in your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, all God's people said. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to give to the ongoing work of Baptist Fellowship, there's a box at the back.